great pleasure. Well, I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome Professor Alan Simpson, who's going to be discussing the crisis of declining environmental and living standards in urban areas and the greening responses that can turn this situation around. I have to say that Alan's CV leaves little doubt that he's deeply committed to the cause of urban forestry. For many years, he ran the urban forestry program at Telford. He became professor of landscape architecture and urban forestry at Leeds Beckett University in 2014. And he's currently chair of Leeds White Rose Community Forest. Add to this a formidable list of publications with two new books out shortly. Add to this too, Alan's campaigning abroad. He's been involved with several European urban forestry research projects and sits on the International Committee of the European Forum on Urban Forestry. Just last week, he was a speaker at the fourth International Urban Trees Research Conference, which goes by the name of Trees, People and the Built Environment. So we're very privileged to have him as a speaker. And I, for one, am much looking forward to hearing about the old windows, the new light, and the latest <laughs> thinking about how trees can transform lives and environments in the world's increasingly densely populated cities. Thank you, Alan. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I, it's a great privilege to, uh, to be invited to talk to you, um, certainly about a subject that I must confess is, is rather, uh, it's like all these things, if your hobby is what you do for a job, um, why stop? So I, I have been doing it for a long time and hopefully we'll, we'll carry on doing it. Um, the outline of the presentation um, is, is fairly simple, really. Uh, what are the old windows? Why do we need to shine new light through them? Uh, what actually comprises this new light? And is it the whole answer or might there be other answers as well? Now, human beings actually are sociable animals. Um, that's why the, the pub is a hub and all that. But we've responded positively, I would argue, to the opportunities that urban living can bring for very many years now. Um, that said, the 21st century is very definitely the urban century. And urban areas worldwide are expected to expand by over 2.4 million people by 2050 which sounds a long time away, but it isn't. And we'll be covering at least an area of 1.2 million square kilometers by expanding urban areas. Uh, and it, it might even be more. So that makes cities really are quite a remarkable creation in many ways. Most of us now live in cities or towns of one sort or another. And through the networks of relationships with each other, and with our physical environment. At least we did do before lockdown, but it will return again in the not too distant future. Now, these relationships that we have with our towns and cities help to create the character and identity of the city landscape. And urban trees and green spaces are critically important um, to that identity. Trees help us to mark the passing of time, they open a window for us to observe the cycle of nature, and that is actually also part of our daily life cycle as well, if we did but know it. But is this just a utopian dream, just designers talking? Has the contemporary urban design failed really to deliver this vision of a city? Are they actually all they claim to be? And do we actually need to shine new light through old windows to try and achieve the, the quality of life. Cities, for an awful lot of people who live in them, are not healthy places to be. Um, and this is something we've got to start thinking about, I think, a little bit more radically, perhaps, than we have done so far. So, the old windows, what were they? And in a way, they were about the arrival of trees in the city. Now, you can go back and find all sorts of old images um, in, in terms of, of, of places in Egypt and what have you. Um, and we have an awful lot of very large cities. Um, some of them work fairly well. A lot of them you think, yikes, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't live there, millions of people. And it's interesting that trees 
have been relatively recent part of urban areas. For example, if you look at a map of Paris in 1615, which you see there, you'll see a few trees along the Seine, um, but not an awful lot of other trees. There's a big wall around the city, really to keep the roast beefs out because we tended to go across there and do things. Um, but it wasn't really until Napoleon III was there and, and he had a word with Baron Hausmann in the 1860s. And they started plowing out a lot of the relatively cheap housing. So a lot, thousands of people were displaced to put in, of course, the, the amazing avenues that they have in there, which everybody knows well. Uh, and they were actually quite sophisticated um, because if you go down the Champs-Elysees, on one side, you'll find London plane trees and on the other side, you'll find chestnuts. And not many people think, I wonder why. Well, the answer is that, that even then they knew that in summer, if you were out in the, the sunshine a lot in your carriage and walking along with all your jewels and what have you, it was a bit dodgy. So you wanted the shade. By the time autumn comes along, it can still be nice and sunny and what have you, but there's not a lot of danger in the sun. Um, so all the leaves will start falling off the chestnuts. So you can still parade up and down the Champs-Elysees and stuff. Um, and all this was thought about. So the sophistication even then um, was, was, was amazingly great. Places like Amsterdam, which we all think are, are well-treated and they are, even they, we, they beat us to it, but they weren't there for, for um, many great lengths of time. But of course now um, all the canals are lined by, by trees. They're actually at the moment relining all the canals in Amsterdam. Um, with, with elm trees, which is what the original trees were, at seven metre centres, so you can get two cars between them, uh, and is going to be one continuous tree pit all the way along the canal. It's costing millions of euros, um, and it won't be done overnight, but you think, wow, that's, that's, that's taking it very seriously, which is great. This country, of course, um, was slightly different. An early map of London looks very green. It was very green, um, but most of it was private. If you were just uh, an ordinary geezer like me, a lot of the places would be locked. It was for the folks that lived there and not, not for, if you like, the, the common people. And we didn't actually like urbanism very much in this country, mainly because we started the Industrial Revolution in many ways. And life expectancy, um, even in the middle of the 19th century, wasn't that great. You had to have been born, educated if you were, get a job, marry, have kids and all the rest of it. And if you made 30, you were very lucky. Uh, and that really was not a very great thing for cities. People actually didn't like them. We officially became urban in 1851. And we actually planted the first street with trees, believe it or not, in Chelsea um, in 1853. Uh, none of them are there now. Uh, so they actually didn't last that long, but okay, they, they were there. But the Industrial Revolution was um, a very polluted time, as, as, as we know, and Hogarth had some fun uh, doing some interesting drawings of London streets. Um, not quite sure what's happening to that little kid in the left-hand side there who seems to be plummeting towards the earth, but anyway. Um, and the streets of London, um, were not very healthy places. When the movements to get green was going, a lot of people didn't think it was a very great idea. John Stewart, allegedly in 1771, wrote that the Russian herb is a preposterous idea at best. A garden in a street is not less absurd than a street in a garden. They're all, more or less, tinctured with the same absurdity, an awkward imitation of the country amid the smoke and bustle of the town. So I guess he didn't like trees very much. Interestingly though, the Quaker philanthropists, who many of whom were behind the urban um, areas and, and certainly behind the, the, the um, getting the industrial revolution going, they were quite the reverse. And it was interesting that Robert Owen in 1816 wrote, the presence of trees is pleasant to the eye, refreshes the workers and improves the health of the district. 
And here in New Lanark, planted trees, um, folks did in, in Bourneville and other places because they knew it made the place better. They would get more out of their workers. They would live longer. People were healthier. And you think that's 200 years ago. And it was only really the beginning of this century when people started saying, do you know, actually trees actually improve. You think we've known that for 200 years. Um, sadly, we haven't always done much about it. Now, I'm not going to go into the key dates particularly, but ideas of trees in the city started getting acceptable really in around 1800. Um, by 1820, we had more than 40 squares in London. And as I said before, 1851, we were an urban population for the first time. Um, and Parliament passed various acts, street, new streets were created. Um, and really, by about the end of the 19th century, um, street trees were almost routine. People um, accepted them. And it's amazing to see how it were planted uh, and what places are like now, because a lot of the trees are still there and along the embankment, of course. Um, so we began to start thinking, hey, trees actually are part of what the urban life is. Things actually took an interesting turn. Um, Ebenezer Howard wrote a book called Tomorrow, A Peaceful Past to Reform, because he did not like the way urbans were going for ordinary folks. And the fact that, that you just didn't live long enough to, to really enjoy your life, he thought was absolutely horrendous. And he wrote his book. He also went in 1901 to a big conference. It was called the City of the Future Conference. It was the first conference on that topic in the world. Uh, it took place in Birmingham. And they all um, went to look at Bourneville, which, which was then up and running and what have you. Um, and they all thought, wow, this is amazing. Howard and his notes actually still exist um, in the Bourneville Village Trust Library. Suddenly thought, I've got it wrong. I thought it was all about economics. It's not, it's about design, it's about trees. So he quickly rewrote his book and published it called Garden Cities of Tomorrow. And that's really when the utopian promise, if you like, took place. Letchworth was the first garden city. Um, and you only have to look at nowadays to see the amount of trees that there are there. And if you actually look at the health of the folks that live there, it's not rocketing above everywhere else, but it is better than an awful lot of towns that don't have that amount of green space in it. During the war, uh, during the, the, the interwar developments, lots of suburbs started growing and it was amazing how the roads and avenues were all named after trees. Didn't always have them there. And there's one place that I used to know called Holly Park, which is there. It's not a holly in sight, um, but in some ways, does it matter? I don't know, but the names of trees were beginning to appear. Now, as the London underground started expanding northwards, um, a lot of interesting places started to be designed. The Harrow Garden Village Estate, where actually I used to live very many years ago, um, and Hounslow. Um, they didn't tell you, of course, they were going to build an airport there, but it didn't matter and gold is green. And you can see the pictures there, they're all drawn, they're all just from, from people's ideas of how it's going to be. But you can see all the trees, particularly in gold is green, and Madam with, with her daughter sitting on the lawn, and the old fellow just watering all the plants and what have you. It was about a very green uh, way of looking at things. So we had really engineered, I suppose, about seven traditional design themes for our um, urban trees, the old windows. And we had avenues and single lines, blocks, grids, small groups, train trees, and landmark trees. Avenues, quite obvious, and quite amazing things. They need a lot of space. Um, sometimes they get it as they do here. This is North Amsterdam. And sometimes they do in places like Harrogate too, where the verges are wide and they, they do a great job. As you'll know, our government has said all new streets have got to be lined by trees. And you think, 
nice idea, but have you realized how much space that's actually going to take up? You can look at the width of the verges there. You need a verge of at least three and preferably four meters to actually have healthy trees. Um, are we really going to have that space? I don't think so. Single lines are um, quite useful. You don't necessarily need um, an avenue. Um, that happens to be um, in Copenhagen. And interestingly, under those trees, which have only been in the ground about three months when that photograph was taken, um, is a drainage scheme. So that in summer, when it gets very hot and increasingly is going to, and trees think, I know, let's close up our stomata and quietly just sit here until the autumn comes and we get some rain. So they don't take in any carbon dioxide, they don't give out any, they don't actually function. They just sit there looking nice. So all the things we said the trees were going to do for us, they don't do. So actually having rain and having moisture underneath the tree pits there is a very sophisticated way of hoping um, that, that will carry on. But single lines you can find um, all really, they are quite powerful and they give a lot of benefits that, that, that trees do. You, um, and even here in Chicago, for example. Um, so that can be good. Blocks, sometimes you can see on the street where there's the space. Um, sometimes they're, they're slightly sort of pruned and what have you. Um, but yes, okay, they're quite useful for sitting areas and places such as that, um, but they're there. Grids are actually quite um, popular in some places. Um, this happens to be um, South West Amsterdam in the commercial area. Um, and there's a grid of 64 trees to actually to stop the downdraft from all buildings. Um, but it works very well. And this is another grid, which actually the trees are right distance apart for the market stalls, which is held three times a week in this location. Uh, and then they pack them all up and put it away and you've got yourself a little square with trees in it. So grids do work as well. Small groups can be quite good. That happens to be in Copenhagen. And that building you see in the middle there isn't as old as it looks. It's all part of the architecture of, of Copenhagen who try to make buildings blend in if at all they can. That's a library and they were going to build it right up in the same building line as the others. And we managed to persuade them not to. Said, Let's plant some trees. Oh, oh that's, you're taking up valuable space. We can prove to you actually the value of those trees it will have on the people that go into the, the library and what have you. And when we did, they said, blimey, you're right. Yeah drop the building back um, and they did. So again groups can be quite powerful rather than just one lonely tree on its own. Trees are a bit like humans they actually they actually like being together and very often they they do grow better. Trained trees we used to do this very much I suppose in our designed landscapes and, and gardens and what have you we don't do it very much now in the public domain but I sometimes wonder why not. Uh, because they can actually do um, a great job. Uh, and it's, as some people say, it's sort of hedge on stilts. Well, yeah, all right. Um, but the idea of actually having trees there and, and not having huge ones that, 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 that overshadow everything come, come very well. Here, these trees have been trained laterally. Um, and this was in the Floriada in the Netherlands, and it was done for shade. So you've actually got an overhang of, of um, trees and, and everybody's um, quite happy, very sophisticated. Landmark trees, I think these are possibly the oldest trees in Amsterdam. Um, they're at Lydza Plain and where the, the city walls used to be. Um, that tree is outside the European Parliament in Strasbourg and is very much a landmark tree. You can find them in all sorts of places. Um, they often weren't planted. It was as the town expanded and there were trees in hedgerows or wherever they were, they just went round them. And so you've got mature trees uh, and it works very well. And I found that one in Malmo and thought, what on earth? That's a weeping beech. And it 
who's trimming that like that? Anyway, eventually found out someone said, why'd you do that? And they actually pay a bloke to, to do that. And they said, oh, but you are English, you should know. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, the grazing line in, in all your wonderful you know, Chatsworths and all the design landscapes. I said, yeah. He said, well, we don't have the cattle and things to do that. So we do it ourselves now so that the light and, and air views can actually carry on under the tree. I thought, limey. Uh, and there are actually a few of them as, as, as landmark trees in, in Malmo. But the big thing about all these is they take up space. And are we actually going to have this space in the future? Um, are our towns and cities actually going to be quite as open as we think? And I suspect actually not. Talk about that in a moment. But apart from these, these basic old windows, of course, there's all sorts of other things. Yes, this was the first um, public park in, in Leeds. It's at Woodhouse Moor and it's still there. And yes, it has very formal planting, uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. Although we now know, strangely enough, that people respond better to less formal landscapes. Uh, some research has been done that people think, well, well, yeah, okay. And they'll go there and they'll do it and that's fine. Um, but possibly less formal might be the answer. And certainly if you go to the Emscher Park in Rhine-Westphalia in Germany, um, which is an amazing reclamation of a, of a previous, very heavily um, industrialized place, all sorts of groups and, and, and very informal planting, millions of trees, but informal. And again, I think that works very well. Malmo again, if you go and look, the new mayor there said, right, I want all trees down most of my I also want suds, urban drainage, gardens and what have you. And they have. And the reason for doing that was to try to keep young people in the city, because at the time, Malmo was going through a very bad patch. All the major unit, uh, uh, industries had closed down, Saab had left, et cetera, et cetera. And he, against the government, said, no, you can't. He said, yes, I can. I'm the mayor, I set up a university. Uh, and now it's an amazing um, city. Uh, very Swedish, in my view, but then that's, my view doesn't count. Um, it's amazing how he's used vegetation to basically bring back uh, the city to its place. And of course, Central Park in New York and places like that. Um, still exist, they still will exist. Um, they're unlikely to build on it, they can't. Um, but I don't think we're gonna do any more of these sort of scale things. The new towns in this country tackled it slightly differently. Um, they didn't see trees as a cosmetic. It was, it was a metaphysic, it was a fundamental. And planted, well, as you can see, six and a half million trees. This is Telford, 138 species, um, about 17% tree cover. And the average in the UK is then was about um, 10.8. It's about 13 now. Um, and it got granted a lot of um, economic benefits. 40% of all the um, investment from Japan and Japanese companies in the UK is in Telford. When they were asked why, because they said the quality of the environment. And that set a lot of people uh, thinking. But again, the, 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 the type of, of, of tree planting was very casual and, and very different. There weren't very many formal bits. Uh, and they got very close to houses, if at all possible. Um, and sometimes you had to amend foundations because of that. Yeah, okay, so you do it. Um, but people benefit being able to see trees and not see them miles away because the architect said, who knows it'll undermine the tree? Well, we can sort that out. So why do we need to shine new light through these old windows? Well, if we've got that, what's the problem? Well, interestingly, there have been a number of surveys um, towards the end of the 20th uh, century, the beginning of the 21st, on trees in towns, 1993 was, was 
okay. It looked at 66 towns and villages and things weren't too bad. Freezing Towns 2 was took place in 2008. Um, and that set people wondering because urban tree cover had reduced um, by up to about 20%. That was the actual thing. And what they found that the, we were planting less in the towns than we had been 15 years previously. Um, about a quarter of all new trees die, I think is actually greater than that personally. I think it's more like 35%. More trees were being felled, often quite unnecessarily. And a third of all local authorities had no actually working tree strategy whatsoever. And people started thinking, ah, that doesn't sound very useful. And if you look at how urbanism was expanding, uh, you probably might have seen this photograph before, but it makes you wonder, it's nighttime, why isn't everybody tucked up in bed with the lights out, for goodness sake? But they're not. And you can see there's not many dark places um, in Europe where we haven't got some urbanism. And the expansion of our urban areas is beginning to move quite radically. We had about three and a half billion people in about 2010. In, by about 2050, the UN reckoned that we have about 6.3 billion. Um, the EU estimated, and they were right, that by 2020, about three quarters of the European population would be urban based. And even more worrying that 60% of the urban areas that exist in just about under 10 years' time have yet to be built. Um, and that's the speed of urbanization in developing countries. Interestingly, in places like here, uh, and I think post COVID particularly, most of the growth probably is going to be in small and medium sized towns, part of polycentric regions not just in the mega cities. Um, people actually, they've got a car, this, that and the other, um, or they can work from home, and don't need to commute. So yeah, why not there? Now in Skipton, which is where I am at the moment, um, in the last what, three, four months, five bedroom houses, the price have gone up um, by something like six to 7% at least in cost. Because people want five bedrooms, because one's going to be an office and they still want more bedrooms. Um, so things are on the move. Europe actually looked at urban sprawl in Europe um, and that worried them even more. Uh, what was even more worrying was that car registrations were four times greater than the registration of births. So a lot of populations are static. Some countries, um, I think it would be un unfair to, but Italy is probably one, that are not enough um, kids are being produced to actually replace the population that is there. Um, and a lot of other countries, um, that's going to be similar. We are not going to be um, immune from this. It's interesting um, that in the 35 years between 1970 and 2005, we increased by about 5 million people. In the 11 years between 05 and 16, we also increased by 5 million people. And we'll have grown to a, about 8 million or 15% increase by about 2035. We've lost just over a million since we left the EU and have gone back to where they came from. Um, but you can't really deny the fact that many of our um, urban areas will increasingly be um, ethno-culturally diverse, they will be multicultural in character, and the question we have to ask ourselves is can actually tree planting beneficially influence the health and well-being and the quality of place for people um, living in such towns and cities? My answer is yes. yes. But how will future urban design um, accommodate trees? And that's clearly something that we have to bear in mind. Now the sprawling city, bad, we must not sprawl. Um, it, it's low residential, unlimited outwards, uh, leapfrog development, no centralized ownership, transport dominated by private cars, fragmented governments, you can read it as well as I. Lots of green, but most of it is in private ownership. 
And of course, it expands and goes out and takes over the, the, the green belt and all the rest of it. Not what we should be doing. Compact city, the urban designers would tell you. Higher residential and employment densities, mixture of land uses, fine grain, increased social economic interactions, um, contained developments, yes, urban infrastructure, low space ratio, so there isn't enough green. Um, and that is a problem. And that graphic on the left hand side there um, was actually devised in 1922. So we've been actually been talking about compact in the cities um, since that time. But there is a paradox here, because for a city to be sustainable, yeah, functions and population must be relatively concentrated at high densities, but a place has actually got to be worth living in. Um, so what makes a place worth living in? Well, lots of things, and it's not limited, but access to daylight and sunlight. If someone builds a tower block and you're living in the shade, we can now approve that your health is actually going to go down um, quite considerably. Potential for good health and well-being. Opportunity to walk unimpeded. Why shouldn't you be able to walk around? Um, and talk to my engineering friends about the, the pedestrian fences and things that they put up. They're not pedestrian fences. If you read the Highways Act, it says they're actually there to maintain vehicle speeds. Uh, so I said, you can't call them pedestrian rails. Anyway, but anyway, access to art, music, culture. A 20 minute city, which we're now talking about, that everyone should be within a 20 minutes walking of basic shops uh, and, and what have you. Um, we always used to be, in the days it used to be, it would be a little shop and it was close by, it would sell you what you needed. Um, that isn't the case now. You have to go to the, to, to the main high street and what have you. And we started thinking again about the 20 minute city. You know, everybody should be within 20 minute walking distance of basic facilities. Yeah, okay. Fresh food and clean water, obviously. Proximity to friends, that is so important. And so many young people now are not saying, I live in that tower block and I work in that one. No, not anymore. That is not life. Sorry, I am not gonna do that. And you think, yeah, good on you, read. But ready access to trees, to woods, and to parks. But so many places, I mean, it's slightly over the top, but are designed as autopia, really the utopia. We design for the car and have done for years. We forget about people. And anybody who says the camera doesn't lie has never really worked with Photoshop. This is a picture of Leeds as it might have been if all the buildings that were going through planning in about 2007 and 2008 um, had been built. They weren't because of the financial crash and what have you, well, only two were built. Um, so it doesn't look like downtown Baltimore, um, but you think, wow, wouldn't it have been a very different city? Uh, and other cities were affected the same if those things had been built. And what would the effect of that been on the quality of life in the city? The answer, awful. So there's a lot of challenges facing our towns and cities. Globalization is the most obvious one, and we're not going to change that. Um, people can move around the world, they will do. Um, global competition, accelerating social and geographical mobility, um, national confusion is life in so many places. But so is social exclusion, and it's growing, as is unemployment and poverty, there are special vulnerable groups from anti segregated cities. Governance is changing, increasing demands on cities, the need for new urban management approaches, challenges for local democracy, and of course, the environment. There's a complete lack of viable, what I would call landscape structure planning, a vision of where you want to be in, I don't know, 30 years, don't exist. Environmental and sustainability problems, climate change, although a number of people that still say, no, oh, don't about climate change. I said, well, what about the weather? Oh, blimey, yeah, that's changing. Okay, we'll call it weather change, but it's still changing. And challenges to lifestyle and mobility, cultural heritage assets, and a lack of space. Where are we going to plant um, these trees? And poor old trees have a big problem in so many urban areas. There is a lack of space. There's a lack of oxygen for them, lack of water, organic material. Remember that thing called soil? They don't see it anymore. 
it's just crushed rock underneath it and damage from salt at this time of year, hundreds of tons are thrown around every day. Um, if you go to Copenhagen this time of year, each tree has a little straw fence around it so that it doesn't get salted. Um, not one in this country. Pruning damage, intentional sometimes, but sometimes done by buses or what have you, uh, and conflicts with pipes and sewers. So it is not a good place for a little tree to be. Sometimes you can come up with some strange things like this, and is this a solution? Well, possibly. Um, but more obviously, this is a typical urban tree pit, um, and that's a typical result. Uh, and this is happening even now, um, which is totally unacceptable. Some countries grabbed the nettle as they thought and started digging up uh, trees out in the countryside, in China this is, and bringing them into the towns and cities, and this is what they look like, and you think, no, this isn't the way to do it either, and that is changing there. So all these things have really been not helping our trees, and we have been hampering the healthy growth of our urban trees um, for years. And if we want the benefits from them, this has to change how we actually look after them, possibly where we put them. There are good examples if you want. This is a tree that we planted in Dortmund Square, um, just to prove that you can. It has 28 cubic meters of uncompacted loam soil. Yes, tree pit installed in the middle. It's a London plain, 11 meters high, cost quite a bit, fully irrigated, so the poor thing will never be dry. It costs 32 grand to put one tree there. Um, it's going, growing well, it's, it's created a, a sense of place. Um, in the summer, places thronging with people and pigeons and all the rest of it. Um, and it's one way to do it. You're only gonna be able to plant one of these and most local authorities probably couldn't even do that. But it does do a sense of place. We all know what happened in Sheffield um, when they started felling perfectly healthy trees for all sorts of reasons. They claimed it was highway reasons and they were dangerous and would be in the future, but no, they've done a complete U-turn on this now because they got so much negative you know, across the world and they actually lost um, income in terms of commercial investment, which was gonna happen. And the people said, no, we're not going to invest in a town that's got your reputation, mate. Um, and of course, one of the big problems, I suppose, is the quality of design now. Um, it's all about money. And okay, it's, this is only a cartoon and yeah, it's humorous, but it's, it's unfortunately, it's true because so much of the building that we're doing at the moment um, isn't really helping the urban forest. So what is urban forestry? And, and, and what are we talking about? Well, this is a definition which was part of a research problem project I did some while ago, and that was that urban forestry is a transdisciplinary activity that encompasses the planning, the design, the establishment and management of trees, woodlands and associated flora and open space, which is usually physically linked to form a mosaic of vegetation in, near and round our built up areas. It serves a range of multi-purposes, functions, and primarily for amenity and the promotion of human health and well-being. Too long, basically find a tall building, a tree, climb up it, all the vegetation you can see in that city and town is the urban forest. But a lot of people say, you can't, it, it's rubbish. You can't have a forest in a town, no, rubbish. Um, but my response to that is, well, you think that the word forest comes, um, is about trees. They say, yeah. I say, well, do you think it actually comes the word, from the Latin word forest, which means out of doors. So the urban forest is really the urban out of doors and it includes all green space in and around our towns and cities. Ah, yeah, okay. And there is a lot of sophisticated research into urban forestry now and, and how it benefits us. And it does, and we can prove all these things. It improves our health and well-being. It improves learning. Uh, children in primary school that can see trees waving through large windows 
um, by the time they're 11, they're at least a year ahead in numerology, in language, and all the rest of it. And we can prove this. Property values increase, focal points to improve cohesion, yes, air quality improvement, of course, offsetting carbon emissions, emissions, promoting biodiversity in nature in the city, which is critical, limiting the risk of flooding, cooling our towns and cities, and promoting inward investment and job creation. And it can even make us drive more safely. Um, all of this once upon a time was just, well, that's just your view of it. Um, can you prove it? Mm -hmm. Now we can prove all those things with scientific and proper um, research that's taken place. But change now is the norm. We live in a time when it seems that actually almost anything can happen. Technology, ecosystems, politics, economics, our everyday habits, change is ubiquitous. Some is positive, some is less so, but mutability is something we're having to learn to live with. And we all, or many of us, live in actually polycentric city regions. In many parts of Europe, North America, and Asia, the speed of urban development over recent years has created these polycentric city regions or the continuous city. It's not going to slow down. Thus, biological balances have altered, biodiversity is reduced, and the space available for urban greening is increasingly limited. And thus making places not pleasant places to live in. Best practice is over. And when I say that, my colleagues say, what? No, 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 we've got to do it. I said, no, if it's best practice, it's done. Can urban forestry create next practice and engage in reconciliation ecology and make cities worth living in? And the answer is yes, we can. So the multifunctional urban forest can be the fourth dimension to the spatial articulation of green infrastructure or I think it should be called critical infrastructure rather than green infrastructure. It still sounds a bit cosmetic, but critical infrastructure isn't. We can make place for residents and visitors and recreation and place this space with meaning. We can make economically viable place, creating, sustaining, and retaining jobs and employment, create social cohesion, health and well-being, perform a range of environmental services, including increased resilience, biodiversity, and that is so important now to get nature back into the city. The system development of cultural multi-ethnic communities create creative habitation, and there is so much more. And a lot of this was actually in the UN's new urban agenda, which came out a, a few years ago. And they were wanting to promote a shared vision of sustainable and inclusive urban proper, uh, prosperity, opportunities for everybody not just those who can afford it, everybody, and environmentally sustainable and resilient urban development. And can urban forestry help? Yeah, it can. And we actually wrote, I do work from time to time for the FAO, we wrote guidelines on urban and peri-urban forestry, quite a thick document, and that was a document that forced the FAO to say, right, all of you now who produce a report on whatever it is, it has to be reduced down to one side of A4. Um, just the key issues, not just typed graphics, color, color green people respond to, those are what you put on the desks of politicians. You don't put the report, they're not going to read it. In, in the days when the executive summary was a couple of pages, isn't it 20 pages long now? No one's going to read it. One side of A4, please. What are the key issues that you've been on about? Put them down. Um, and that was actually the start of a very interesting process of actually making all reports down to one side of A4, which we still do. So the best way of foretelling the future is actually to create it. And we now have to design resilient communities as part of our polycentric regions that are ready for anything. Um, so what are these new lights that we need to shine through these old windows to do this? Well. This is Singapore. You had a talk about Singapore earlier, so I'm not going to spend much time on it, but it was interesting how um, they were responding to the issues of having to do that. You'll find green walls, green roofs, and also in all sorts of city. In Stuttgart, for example, about 40 odd percent of all the buildings in the city centre have got green roofs. 
very simply because the local council said all buildings that have a public role must have a green good enough and they have um, and we all know that they actually can do um, interesting things but the thing I want to talk about perhaps more than anything else is the vertical urban forest um, and this is Bosco Verticali in some ways the first modern one in Milan and Stefano Barrei was the, the, the architect who I know um, and this has caused a lot of debate we put it that way um, it was began to be constructed in autumn 2009. It was officially opened in, in October 14. There are two towers. One is just over 111 meters tall and the other is, is, 80, is 78. It has 771 trees on it. Um, it has 20,000 other plants. It has 49 different plant species. 40, uh, 480 people live there. And it takes in about sort of 20,000 um, um, parts of, of um, kilograms we get right away, of, of um, CO2 per year. And you think, wow, but was it the original idea? Well, no, it wasn't. Where the idea came from actually um, was this tower in Luca, which was actually built in the late 14th century. Mm. Um, and Stefano saw that and thought, oh, yes, I think we can do that. Um, and it's it's brilliant. It really is nice. But the real stuff behind it really was uh, Frederick Unterwasser. I don't know if you come across him. He changed his name so many times. But when he was doing this, he was called Unterwasser, so that will do. And he started thinking we've got to start building differently. Cities are not working, and we have to live in cities. We want to live in cities, but we want them to be um, worthwhile. So he said the horizontal belongs to nature, the vertical belongs to man, but where snow and rain falls, vegetation grows in the city. And I don't know if you've ever been to Vienna um, and seen the Unterwasser House. Um, it was opened in the beginning of 1987. It is public housing. They don't let you walk around it now. They used to once, um, and I've been around it a couple of times, and it's unbelievable. I mean, how, if you look at that and say, this is public housing, we want to build this, wow, carry on. And it is an amazing place to be. Um, and again, the, just the quality of life um, in that place is, 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 is phenomenal, mainly because of the amount of trees and vegetation that, that are there. So you can see where Stefano got his stimulation from um, for coming up um, with Bosco Verticali. And it is sophisticated. Trees that were planted on it were actually trained in a wind tunnel um, with winds of 190 kilometers an hour, so that when they were taken out and put on the building, they said, well, this is better, mate, Whoa. <laughs> not at all, not a problem at all. Evergreen plants are on the southwest side and deciduous on the northeast side. There is an irrigation system um, which incorporates wastewater from, from all the apartments and, and what have you. Maintenance and management system is in place. Most people can, if they want to look after their own bits, they don't have to. Um, there are folks that will come along and do it and twice a year, there are real official folk turn up to look at all the trees. There is seasonal diversity and there is significant biodiversity that's been accomplished. And you think, well, hey, yeah, this is okay. And you can see it at different times of year and inside and looking out, it is just absolutely amazing. And uh, I, I think it's great. A lot of people think it's rubbish. You can't put trees on buildings. Well, yes, you can. Um, and the old adage, of course, that a tree on your doorstep, a forest in your mind, is absolutely true. You can stand out in one of those apartments and just look out through the screen. You're not in downtown Milan. You could be anywhere. And the benefits on people's health and well-being and on the immediate part of Milan where that building is, is absolutely phenomenal. So what can we learn from Bosco? Well, it's a project for the environmental survival of contemporary cities. Um, if space is going to be starting limited and you can't go sideways, why not go upwards? It has to be a possibility. 
it multiplies the number of trees in the city. As I said, there are 771 on this building. It's a tower for trees inhabited by humans, not the other way around. It's an anti-sprawl device. So again, we're talking about a compact city um, and you can have habitable areas of a compact city. It demineralizes urban surfaces. Um, it reduces the pollution of the environment. It reduces energy consumption. It's a multiplier of biodiversity. The birds, the butterflies, all that, that actually inhabit that place now is absolutely unbelievable. Um, and it's happened in a relatively small number of years. It's an ever-changing urban landmark uh, and it's a living ecosystem. What more can you possibly want? As a result of that, the number of vertical forests actually are growing quite amazingly and I had uh, lots of examples but I'm not got the time to tell you but just a few the Tower of Cedars in Lausanne was built and is doing very well thank you the riverside at, at Tirana is going to look like that some of that has started to be built um, it's on its way there's a new town being built east of Cairo um, because you can't build anything in Cairo now um, that's what it's going to start to be looking like and the country that has really taken on this is China. They are building towers all over the place at the moment. Um, these are in Nanjing at the moment um, and going to be all over the place. Um, that is Huangang, as it might be. Again, some of that has started. It's not looking like that just yet, um, but it, it may well do. Um, Luzhou, is probably going to be the first vertical forest city. Um, they, I didn't think they would do it. I know they talked about doing it. I thought, mm, I'm not sure they will, but they are. Uh, and you think, wow. So Chinese urban futures, um, this is their idea, not mine. Uh, this is how they start seeing we are going to have to make urban cities work like we need the vegetation, we need the trees, we need the health and happiness of the people, we need the biodiversity, we need nature. All that has been driven out of the cities. We now have to bring it back. And we can only do that, not nature on its own. I shouldn't tell you show you this, but this was a building that was put through planning in Leeds um, as the version. It's not really very good and I'm glad to say the planners said uh, no go away and come back with something a lot better if you want to do it which they haven't done at least not yet so having said that there are other helpful beams of new light other than those alighting on the vertical forest the vertical forest arguably is not always the whole answer and again I could think of so many examples uh, but I thought of one that, that probably shows it quite well um, and that's the Maxima Park in Utrecht in the Netherlands. And West 8, the company, were asked to design a, a nature reserve and a park in, in an expanding area of Utrecht. And they looked at each other and said, it's the Netherlands, you just want it sort of watery. And yes, yeah, they said, no, we need to move on. So they started looking um, at pergolas. And people said, what the hell are you what? What's that got to do with nature? And they actually started doing an awful lot of research, um, which was actually quite unbelievable, uh, into nature and how nature actually would respond to a pergola. Both birds, um, all sorts of, um, well, some native plants and some not, I suppose, um, but, but, and all the rest of it. Then they started looking at other pergolas and all sorts of other places, uh, and they came up with a design, which eventually the Utrecht well, council basically said, well, yeah, okay. Uh, and so the Maxima Park was born. Um, the pergola is just short of four kilometers long, um, and it's uh, an um, absolutely amazing park. And if someone said, that's actually a nature reserve. What? It is. The amount of nature that is there far exceeds anywhere within miles. And you think, yeah, again, it's shining new light 
and it's doing things in a different way. And it is next practice, which is what we start thinking about. But the ironic thing is, um, if you come out of the Maxima Park and go down the street a little way down towards the main station, what we'll come across is wonderful. They're actually building a vertical forest as well. Uh, so you think, yeah, okay, not a problem. Um, where they built the park, there was space and they're prepared to do it. Where that is, there isn't any space. So instead of going sideways, um, you go up. So with the expansion of our urban areas, um, which we talked about before, um, we've got to start thinking about how we do this sort of development um, a lot more radically than, than we, we currently do. Major city regions throughout Europe um, constitute the nervous system, of the economic and political body of the continent. The more nation states wane, the more city regions are emerging as a driving force in making uh, a new uh, European society. And that's not EU, that's just European as a continent. Um, and you've seen that. Uh, it's getting very crowded. But let's think of positive change. Uh, humans have had a long and deep cultural relationship with nature, with their trees, their woodlands and their landscapes, um, and a relationship that transcends, I would argue, national cultures and sits as an equal alongside our scientific and our economic and our ecological, and possibly even our spiritual relationship. But most of us now live in towns and are people actually more interested in the price of a loaf of bread or a litre of fuel for their car than now nature? Has nature become more of a, and trees, a cosmetic? No, I don't think so. If you work with any community groups, okay, you have to start with, and we've done quite a lot of work on this. Sometimes you have to use artists to get the trust. Um, if you turn up in a suit and say, oh, I'm an architect, they sort of look off. If you turn up, and say I'm an artist, oh, come in, have a drink mate, sit down, whatever, you're in. Um, and you start scratching the scene and nature is still there. So I would argue that urban forestry um, has arguably done much to start positively rekindling this relationship between people, nature and, and the urban areas. It's optimistic. Why would you plant trees and things if you didn't think there was a viable future ahead? And there's so little optimism around um, at the moment. Um, and we've got to look forward to the future and, and strive for our virtual, our futures to be happy and healthy and creative. Vertical urban forests can play an important role in this. Um, and you only have to look at areas, you think which are the well off ones, which aren't. And we know with this virus, that if you live in a place like the top part of that, you've got 49% greater chance of catching the virus than you live in the southern bit. This is not acceptable. So trees in the urban realm, the future. We must maintain and improve a network of interconnected urban forestry in cities, including all types of vegetation, green elements, and green spaces in private um, and public realm. Guarantee the presence and or the accessibility of green space in neighborhoods without minimal private outdoor spaces. Increase the urban forest green fraction in cities on the windward side and the prevailing summer wind direction and keep cold air corridors open. We need natural ventilation. We've got to create diversity of microclimates, sun, half shade, shade through diverse tree planting um, because not everybody does want to sit in the sunshine, believe it or not. They actually like sitting in the shade from time to time. We've got to create flexible multifunctional spaces in parks, to facilitate individual uh, thermal adaptation and create gradients and borders of open areas, shading with sunshade um, provided in closed vicinity. Um, implement trees with large canopy cover in street and uh, is on the agenda. But again, highways people say, hmm, no, it can trap as it can. Uh, pollution, so we have to be careful. Create diversities of microclimates, sun and shade, street canyons, um, implement green elements in street canyons at various heights, and that could be balconies. But will there be the space to do this in the compact city? And I don't think there will be. 
So to conclude, there are no more new frontiers. We've actually got to make it here. Um, Branson might be able to go off to Mars, most of us not. So trees in the public realm demand better transdisciplinary design and landscape structure planning to significantly improve the quality of the resilience of our towns and cities by creating better and more viable urban habitats than now exist. And we can do this by shining new light in our windows. We must therefore more plant more trees in our towns and cities to connect, to define and green our polycentric city regions, the right tree in the right place for the right reasons. The vertical forest is not the only answer, but it is a significant layer. And this must be part of a belief in the value and importance of our plural multicultural cities as a nucleus of our culture, together with a far more radical approach to post-industrial resilient urban design, urban forestry and placemaking, with open minds that are prepared to shine new light through old windows and that includes vertical urban forests. And a thought to take away from probably, I think, one of the best philosophers of the 20th century, um, Frank Zappel, who said, a mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it's not open. And you think, yeah, how true. So what are we doing this for? Well, we're doing it for poor old folks like this. Um, he needs to lose a few stone. He's been working at home. He needs to get out. He has got out. He drove there absolutely knackered. Um, but really who we're doing it for are these folks. It's the next generation and the generations after that that we have to get this right for. Um, and it's no good just waiting for them to take over. We're not dead yet. We've got to be able to do it. So another thought to take away is the choices and decisions we make today will resonate at least into the 22nd century. And if we get them wrong, will bequeath a bleak future to subsequent generations. We surely need to look ahead and horizon scan further than most politicians and planners do. In particular, if our despoilation of nature causes mass extinctions, which it is, by neglect, by error, or by malign intention, then as E.O. Wilson said, it is the action that future generations will least forgive us for. Um, and how right that is. So if you have been, thank you for your attention. Um, very happy to answer some questions. Uh, and if you want to read up a few references, there are some. If you want to send me something in terms of email, my email address is at the bottom there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Alan. That was really inspirational. I've been waiting for longer than I can tell you to hear someone talk so enthusiastically about Bosco Verticale. So <laughs> you've made my year, absolutely. I'm a believer. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and for giving us such a, a kind of, I mean, there is a lot of, there's a lot of bad news in what you were talking about, which we're all aware of, but there's also a lot of good news too. And I love new light, new practice. It's, it's a nice break from best practice, which can be a place to hide, can it? So yes, thank you exactly. very much. Um, there are loads and loads and loads and loads of questions. Oh, so I... <laughs> um, we'll start to move through them. I just want to say before um, we, we tackle the questions, uh, Jennifer White has offered up um, some really good tools. One answers the question, in fact, which, um, uh, the question was from Maxine, uh, what type of trees or species of trees should we, would be particularly effective at fighting urban pollution? And Jennifer's put up um, right trees for CC. Uh, .org .uk, um, which gives a good uh, suggestions and examples. So that's just, um, a tool, a toolkit that we can use. And Jennifer also um, offered a, a comment, not a question necessarily, by saying that she agrees with you entirely about the need for change and suggested another resource, which is called Trees and Design Action Group. Um, so that that's just um, two, two things for people to note down. So on to the questions. Um, I think I'll go more or less in order. 
Um, the first is really about funding, which you do touch on um, and, and, and you've outlined. It's, it's, it's very difficult, isn't it? Um, the decision making about uh, how to plant and, and what to plant, where to plant and where to put the money. Um, Peter Ransom has asked, with our ever shrinking local authority funding for public spaces, combined with our ever increasing privatization, how can we counter this? Very good question. And I, it might be interesting how the privatization bit goes. I mean, the government has been talking about changing the health service, as you know, today and this, that, and the other. The, the big problem with trees is they've always been seen um, as a liability, um, local authorities. And we can now prove that they're not, they're actually an asset. And for example, I have talked to a few local authorities that have declared climate emergencies and this, that, and the other. I said, why haven't you TPO'd all your healthy, mature trees? Then? And they say, well, why not? I said, well, you've declared a climate emergency, fine. But one of the key things that's actually going to help to resolve that are the healthy, mature trees that you have in your town and city. Um, and why, how aren't you protecting them? Equally, why aren't you engaging in succession planting? Why are you gonna wait till these poor old things are peel over and then plant another little tree? Um, and, and why don't you plant one now? So that in 30 years time, it's going to be up in the air. And it's amazing how people, oh, we felled a tree, but we're planting three to take its place. And I say, well, that's fine. Um, but you realize the key issue about that tree was its canopy. So if you want to replace what you've just done, you've actually got to plant 40 trees. Um, so where are you going to do that? But you're right. And as I say, space is going to be difficult. It's interesting in, in the new um, national planning uh, thing. It, the first draft when it came out some months ago, trees hardly featured in it. Um, the one that's out now, which is still draft, admittedly, um, paragraph 130 starts talking quite extensively about we've got to start planting more trees. They even mention tree offices. And if this gets through, then local authorities that haven't got a tree officer are probably going to have to get one because who else is going to look after the trees? Um, and I think it's paragraph 179 talks about retaining the ones that they've got. Don't just, and that is one of the problems, not one of the problems they hit in Sheffield, that the trees being planted 50, 60 or more years ago, and nobody had done a hapeth of anything since. A bit of pruning and what have you, but that was all. So actually, you can't, poor old trees think, well, they've just got to look after themselves. Out in the native forest, yes, of course they do. Um, but it's interesting if you go to what I think is the last bit of actual native forest in Europe, which is on, on the Polish Czechoslovakian border, about 60% of it's dead. Uh, and you think, wow, this is, looks, it's perfectly natural. That is a perfectly natural way of life. Big tree falls down and then all sorts of stuff comes up. Um, we have to actually manage our public realm. And, and I think there also has to be a skills uh, appreciation. Um, the old days, when, oh, I'm the designer, I've got my Omega. Uh, and you think, well, you've done that, mate, but someone's going to have to look after that in perpetuity. Their skills are different than yours, but they're just as valid. Uh, and the old thing, management is a tool by which design never ends. Um, so we actually have to start working together. You can actually persuade local authorities um, to start doing planting. Um, because now so many people sort of say, Oi, what, what are you doing, mate? Uh, and people are coming around to the fact that we've got to plant trees um, as well as looking after what we've got. So even when the sort of local elections come around, you'd be amazed um, how many aspiring politicians are going to be talking about, oh, we're going to do tree planting and this, that, and the other, um, because they know people at long last are saying, yeah, COVID has helped that, and people have suddenly realized actually what they've been missing, and 
um, it is amazing how um, people's health, a, a 20 minute walk in a slightly wooded area. Um, and the, the medics, if there are any listening, will, will, will confirm it. You can take people's blood pressure and what have you before they go and take all that and all uh, after that about 20 minutes. They are a different person. And if they did that every day, the quality of their life would improve amazingly. Uh, if we got green places and can persuade local authorities to do it, which I think we can, and I take the point about the fact that money is going to be tight, it is. Um, but we can save the NHS billions a year um, if we get the quality of places right. The government have said that. That's not me saying it. The government has said that. So we, sh we shift the spending around because this is our new beginning, our new practice, not our best practice. Um, this is a quick question, um, but it is a follow on. I'm not exactly going in order here, but Sue Barnard asked um, about, um, well, something, essentially she was saying her council uh, persists in planting specimens or trees that are, are so small that they're very susceptible to vandalism. And I would imagine they're also vulnerable in other ways as well. Um, have you found a solution? Is that just a, a lobbying exercise or an education exercise for either the, 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 the tree officers or the, the councilmen and women? Well, from a biological point of view, very often the smaller you plant, the better, because the, the, mm. the, the, the little tree can get used to where it is and think, oh, yes, yeah. it's too bad, and, and, and start growing. Um, that said, um, it still has to look reasonable from day one. Now, that doesn't mean you necessarily do what we did in Dortmund Square and spend an awful lot of money on an 11 meter tall tree. No. Um, in the right place, possibly, um, but alongside your streets or what have you, no. But I still think you have got to plant um, reasonable sized trees where you can do, um, because it's, it's, it's important that people actually start believing in you as a local authority or a tree officer or, or what have you, and sticking in a few sticks and say, well, you know, okay, you won't see it, mate, because you'll be dead. But you're, yeah, your kids probably will. Isn't uh, isn't good enough. It depends on the species. It depends on the location and and all sorts of things. And one of the things that we have got to do is increase the species that we we plant. Uh, you mentioned TDAG earlier. If you go onto their website, there is a a download of tree species for green infrastructure which has 280 species in it. Um, it tells you the good, the bad, and all the rest of it about those species. But basically it's saying we've actually got to start planting completely different species in our towns and cities. As the towns and cities are gonna get warmer and hotter, your native species, native species is, gonna sit, this is gonna sit there and gonna think. Sit there and thinking. Yeah, I can hear yeah, myself. I can hear myself. Don't know where that's coming from, um, but but, um, um, but but um, if if we yes if, if, if we we yes, have to be careful yes. about the size of plants. It it is in the public domain. If you're working on the street and walking path, they have to be fairly big, I think, which means they're fairly more expensive. But we've managed to persuade quite a few highways folk to say instead of planting twenty trees badly just plant half a dozen really well. Yeah. Um, and although you may say, well, why, why haven't you planted down there as well? So, you know, he's weak. Um, and that's, they're beginning to say, yeah, you, you're probably right. Why, why just stick them all in and watch half of them die within two years? It's, and the argument is we've all got a vested interest in success. Whether we're highways, whether whoever we are, we've got a vested interest in success. So. The fact that we've all got to succeed means we've all got to work together um, a lot better than we, than we do do. Um, but to get back to the question, yes, size is important. And if you can get away with a slightly smaller one, I, that's okay. But sometimes um, because the photographs are gonna be taken the day you finished and what have you, and the, the local 
TV will be there. It's got to also look good, other than people say, well, what was all that about? It's just a load of sticks. Well, um, there are games to be played. Yeah. Um, before I ask you a couple more questions or put forward a couple of more questions, I just want to remind everyone that you can listen to Alan's um, talk again. In um, next week, we'll send a link and for you. <laughs> the, no, it's there's a lot in it, and it would be great to listen to it again. Um, we'll send a link tomorrow, and it'll be up for one week on the Gardens Trust website and then after that it will be up on the IHR website so you have time there's no rush but it's a, it's a lovely resource for us to have and there are a lot of thoughts in it um Alan there are two questions um about research that I'm going to put together um Colin says um what is the source of the research that was looking at informal garden spaces versus formal garden spaces. And then a second question um, from Michael Gilson is about um, the research behind the positive impacts on primary school children. Can you right. just quickly uh, just tell us wh what, what those sources are? Yes, I, well, I'm not sure I can actually give you the um... The paper, but what about, yeah, in terms of um, overly designed places um, and, uh, versus more natural ones, the, the first research on that was, I think, actually done in Poland, believe it or not, where they were slightly concerned that they were doing a lot of parks and greening and putting lines of trees down all the parks. And people were using it, but they weren't actually getting out of it as much as they could have done. And, and they would talk to people, this, that, the other. And to be fair, they, they were prepared to respond. Uh, they didn't change it, but on the new design, they started saying, ah, right, let's just have clumps of trees um, rather than just formal things. So, and why do we always cut the grass? Like um, square kilometers of damn stuff. Why not just leave some of it? Um, and, that has helped because some of the grass is actually a lot better than carbon sequestration than some trees, for example. So there are some swathes of, of, and people found that so um, positive. And that was looked at by some, some Scandinavian colleagues and they thought, oh, I wonder if that would apply here. Hmm, I don't know. Uh, and I don't think it would necessarily apply everywhere. Uh, and I think certainly in some multi-ethnic places, people like to be able to see what's going on rather than think, I wonder what's around the corner. Hmm, don't know, I won't go around there. They want to be able to see. And strange enough, the design of the Amsterdam Boss was like that, where you'd have a footpath that goes round, lots of trees and understory, but where those trees came to the edge of the path, there was no understory at all. So you could look straight through. And if there was a bunch of lads around the other side, you could think, hmm, tell you what, Often I'll go that way, um, and and so that original Polish research has been replicated in quite a few places, uh, and I've got an amazing couple of slides, believe it or not, which took well, a couple of years ago, ago now, um, in Canary Wharf in in London. It's all right, someone will pick that up, and it was a wonderful new little square. It, was, it cost millions of pounds, lots of trees, and all the rest of it. Um, one lonely lady walking across it. And if you actually literally came and went down a slope, it wasn't even a minute's walk. There's just a green mound down the bottom there, just into one of the wharf um, streets. One lonely tree in it, 60, 70 people on there, just eating their lunch and, and what have you. Um, and because it's a nicer place to be, you can talk to your mates. You don't have to sit in this, this, this sort of, um, formal seating and what have you. So there's quite a lot of evidence around that sometimes, and sometimes you have to design formal places, of course, but occasionally it can be nice because your work is formal, your building's formal, and you just come outside and actually sit in the shade and listen to the birds and think, yeah, this is, this is better. The original research 
on the primary schools was done in Seattle. And their primary schools are not unlike some of ours, and that is the window sills are way up. So you can only look up at the sky, really. And the teachers say, yeah, keep, keep on working. And someone thought, I wonder. And they experimented with actually taking the wall out of one of these things and just blazing it. And there were trees outside and what have you. And again, the teachers were told, no, you know, if that kid's just, just gazing out of the window, just give them five minutes. Obviously, you can't do it for the whole day. They've got work to do. But don't shout at them. Just, you know. And this has been monitored for a number of years. And even while that was being done, um, the Swedes picked up on it and thought, oh, we'll do the same here. And they did. And as I say, after ooh, five, six years or more, they said these kids are just so far ahead. And therefore, it's changed the design, certainly in Seattle, of all primary schools and quite a lot of other places. Um, in that connection with nature, which we think is something that you have to be taught, you're not. You actually have it. And again, some of the German schools now where they will not let you drop your kids off in your SUV outside the door. for the very simple reason that that kids got up, they were late, oh, come on, have your breakfast, get them there. They're not ready to start learning. You have to drop them if you're gonna go in by car anyway, at least 50 meters away. Uh, and they have to walk, not down a straight line, but start a curved path and the trees are on the opposite side of the sun, so the sun's coming down. There might be a pond or a pool, it doesn't have to be, what have you. But that 50 meters, meeting a couple of your mates and what have you, listening to the trees, by the time you get to school, you are ready to start learning. And again, medically, we can prove this now as well. So it's, it's, there's, there is quite a lot of research out there, um, that, but it originally started in Seattle, as I say. Um, and Kathy Wolf and one or two other folks. Uh, but it's, it's gone on to a lot of other countries. Not this one yet. We're still working on it. That's so brilliant because it's it's so simple. Yes. <laughs> it just needs the thought and then just do it. It's just so simple. Absolutely. Makes so much sense. I mean, quite a lot of what you've said in a positive way is very intuitive about you know, sitting under a tree or, or, or yes. seeing a, 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 a clump of trees or leaves on the ground and, and, and moving out of your, you know, that, that kind of dumped out of the SUV kind of, you know, four by four mood. We, you know, it is also about time, isn't it? And, and I loved what you said about trees help us to feel the passing of time. I think that's one of the things you miss very much in the city. And I've certainly missed during lockdown, being locked down in London. You know, you, 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 you kind of lose, lose the plot on what, what's <laughs> happening with time, what's happening with the seasons. And that's brought, you know, that's been, that's been coming through to me in a subliminal way. And quite a lot of what you've been saying about uh, urban trees. Um, I just have two questions about sort of, urban trees versus issues with trees other places. Um, one is, 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 is about sort of how we keep track of, of, of our targets in terms of forestry. And this came from Sarah talking about a target in Scotland to increase forestry um, or planting of trees, forestry by 18,000 hectares per year. Um, her question is, does this include urban forestry or is this outside of cities and large towns? When the draft English tree strategy came out um, ooh, some while ago now, um, it didn't really, um, I'm a bit biased, I have to admit it, I suppose, that it didn't really include urban trees. It was about, it talked about forestry and, and uh, rural areas and this, that, and the other. Um, and an awful lot of people um, got back to the government and said, well, what about where people actually live? Um, you're talking about places where people visit, yeah, um, but they don't live there, at least where it's not many. Uh, what about towns and cities where, where most people live, where we do want health and well-being to increase and what have you? So the second draft 
which is probably coming out in May. Um, I've been told by someone who's <clears throat> working on it um, that it's going to be much more urban um, and it will be about planting trees in, in urban areas, um, which, is, which is good because as I say, that's where, where most of us live. It is different. Um, I work on what at least five different design domains, I suppose, one the urban forest, um, the suburban forest, the peri-urban forest, um, what I would call the ex-urban or commute, um, and then rural. Up until this pandemic, we had the longest commutes of any country in Europe. And you could go out to a, a nice little town or a village up in the dales or what have you and say, oh, you know, we're in the rural areas. And I said, well, have you seen all the BMWs and the Audis and what have you parked? And yeah, they, 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 yeah, they live here, but they actually work in Leeds or York or whatever. And it's the same in so many other places. I mean, how many people um, commute from Grantham to, to, to London every day? Uh, it's, it's amazing the distances we, we travel. So just because we live in the countryside actually doesn't mean we're rural people. We're not. We're actually ex-urban people. And all those five different domains um, actually had quite different approaches to design and species and, and, and all the rest of it. So this simple urban versus rural is not as it now is, really, as I say. The actual genuine rural areas um, are relatively small. That said, we, I can see no reason at all why almost all planting shouldn't be reasonably productive. We are the second largest importer of timber of any country in the world. China is the first. Um, and <laughs> why shouldn't we start growing a bit more of our own? Why don't we do agroforestry? Why don't we get forestry and farming back together again? Because they went their separate ways uh, at the beginning of this century, um, 20th century. Um, it's, it's all about land use, so why can't farmers grow? Thing? And there was an amazing thing, you may or may not know, between 2015 and 2017, uh, Beijing planted 54 million trees as a ring forest around Beijing. And I thought, oh, I mean, yeah. And I thought, mm -hmm. so when I actually went to look at it, uh, a little bit, was, but most of it was brilliant. And I thought, yeah, only some government like this could say, oi, we want your land. They didn't. They went to a farmer and they're actually renting that land off the farmer and giving that farmer an annual income for those hectares that he's given over for the tree plant. And I've mentioned that to some political folk here. You want the land or you want to put forestry against rivers to, to stop flooding and what have you. Why don't you rent the land off the landowner? The farmer, now if it's a tenant farmer, it's not up to him. I, I, I know there are difficulties. But isn't that actually one way of getting the land that we want to do? Mm -hmm. So it didn't go down very well. But yes, we've got to plant. I mean, the government in, in England wants to plant 30,000 hectares a year. Was it last year we planted, what, um, 1,500? So <laughs> we've got to start thinking about this. Where are we going to get the plants from? Um, we have pests and diseases. Are we really going to be able to grow all those? No. Not at the moment, so we're going to have to import them. Um, all sorts of threats of more pests and diseases, so we've got to be very careful about biosecurity and all sorts of other issues. Uh, and we just have to be a little bit careful that these aren't just warm political words to, to make people think, oh yes, we're moving in the right direction. It's going to be a hell of a job to plant that number of trees. Um, and I've managed to persuade, and I won't tell you which, but a national park to stop using plastic tubes. Uh, well, you have to. I said, no, you don't actually, but you've got to plant differently. I don't want you to plant in lines. I don't want you to plant one of this species, then one of that species, and whatever you. That's right insofar as you want the variety, but plant a group of 20 of one species, and then over there, a group of 20 other species, or whatever it is, um, because trees actually compete best against themselves. Um, we always know that oak is so reluctant to grow that everything else would overtake it and go, oh, you've got to do things differently uh, and we can do it. Um, 
but it is an awful lot of planting. Where is it going to go? Um, is there going to be the money to look after it? Because it must be properly managed. Um, can we start thinking, we're not going to do the old forestry clear felling anymore, though no, that's, that's out. So we've got to do selective management, either small group selection or single trees. It, it's uh, a fairly radical change. One or two places, and I, I, when I was in Lausanne in Switzerland a while ago, um, huge housing area was going up against um, some, some forest, of course the forest is saying, oh, how do we keep people out of them? I said, you don't. It's their forest now, if they live here. Well, it's I said, no, 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 it's theirs. They live here now. Have you got any old trees? A few. I said, right, we'll put in a footpath system that goes past the old trees. Um, and, and yes, you're still going to be felling trees. Had you thought of using actually horses to take them out? And of course they laugh like drains. I said, no. Horses? No, no. I said, why not? If you're only going to take down selective trees, people will love the fact that instead of having mach machines the size of a block of flats turning up and, and making it, horses. And I thought, no, they won't do it. But I went back and they had, they'd started using horses, um, as a few places in this country do already, um, particularly where you've got people close by. You could get away with all sorts of things up in the hills because no one was there. Now we're planting trees adjacent to existing communities on the edge of towns and what have you. Um, and I've already, in a number of places, gone to, to communities and said, we'd like to plant up that area. Are you happy with that? They say, yes, provided that it doesn't look like a First World One graveyard. That these lines of plastic. I said, no, well, A, we won't use them. And B, we'll plant actually quite densely not having to pay out for plastic um, and in a couple of years you'll actually see a lot and it has to grow to about 1.8 meters before people suddenly think that's woodland because that's what most people's height is or, or less and in autumn it smells like woodland and so it doesn't, one, sorry. doesn't take long to get there sorry what, no, i was just going to say that one of the things that also seems to be coming out is that in thinking about urban trees and urban forestry, you really need to be thinking about, you know, the whole of a country, all the landscapes, yes. a suburb, you know, as you mentioned, suburban, rural, rural encroachment, you know, you have to have a really cohesive, large plan. And as you say, you know, it's a huge job to achieve that many trees going in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it has to be taken seriously at the highest level, really, to achieve it, because it must it's tippy toes on top of so many different people and systems and bodies and committees. And, you know, it's, it's a big issue, really. I've, I've been trying to get some local authorities to advance planting, as we used to do in the new towns. And they'd know which areas are going to be for housing over the next 10 years, say. So why not plant a load of trees around the outside? A, the local community would say, right. oh, that's something. And yes, some might have to go because you might have to put an access road in or what have you. But you'd have a receiving landscape. Mm. Um, and mm. You wouldn't mm. have to sort of, mm. and, uh, and it, it can be done. It can be done. That's a fantastic idea, receiving landscape. Um, we've, we've had loads of questions. I'm going to ask just a final one that combines two, really. Um, the, one of the questions was, well, they're both about work. Where are people working, essentially, in your ideal, you know, reformed urban setting? Um, you know, how do you combine the people and what needs to be achieved in an urban setting with this rejigging of the space? Um, does that does that make sense? What I'm saying? How how will we work? Where will we work? Um, are we going to go upwards? We should. Should we be trying to work in Bosco verticales? Wouldn't that be fantastic? Yeah. Well, yes, I, I, I think we should. Um, I mean, I, th I think if you have to live or work in any tower block, let's call it like that, um, then it has to be worth living or working. Uh, and as you say, really, we, we've learned during this, this lockdown and what have you. The mental health of folks have been living in a 30-story concrete block, um, possibly with a, a little 
railing outside, which you could put a handy in a pot and that's about it. Um, and uh, the effect on their health has been horrendous. The effect on the kids that grow there has been horrendous. Um, and when you don't know, then there's, there's an excuse. Once you do know, there isn't any excuse. Um, and I, I think we have got to start thinking about incorporating, not necessarily um, like Bosco Verticali. I mean, that, that's, a, 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 I think, a brilliant example, but they won't necessarily all look yeah, like yeah. But I, But I think we can start thinking, um, for example, um, some housing, it all was some years ago in North East Amsterdam. They said, right, you're going to build them. You can't put any downspouts. So you can't actually get rid of any water that pours on these housing to the public domain. Of course, the architect said, but the flipping canal just over there. Well, what, what do you mean you can't? I said, no, all the water that falls on this housing has to be used by the housing. Yeah. Anyway, to cut a long story short, um, the highest is five stories in every. There are roof gardens, there are kids' play areas, the things all over this house. It's quite a big area. Um, it's brilliant. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and, and it's all um, irrigated by natural water that falls on the building. And you think, yeah, these are the sort of things that you know, we want a local authority to say, oi, no, you, any, any twit can design a building that we've been doing for the last hundred years. Let's design a new one. Um, mm. I also think, incidentally, which is not really to do with this, uh, we've got to start using reconstituted timber a lot more. Um, because I used to get shot at because I used to travel so much around the world and uh, for, for flying and, you know, carbon to whatever. But aviation produces, what, three, four percent of that. Manufacture of concrete and steel for buildings produces just short of 11 percent. Mm. Um, so haven't we got to start thinking about that? Mm. And there's a couple of amazing buildings in Vancouver, all made out of out of reconstituted timber. Again, they've got plants growing on them. And there's a housing estate being built in Leeds at the moment, sitting out of just that. And if you want a car parking space, you have to pay an awful lot more for your house. So they say, it's in the city centre. Why do you want a car? Oh, you're right. And they're selling like hot cakes. People know we want a better quality of life. Um, so it, it is beginning to happen. It is beginning to happen. But I, but I think um, cities are possibly going to change after the, clock, the lockdown. Um, some people like working from home, which is quite understandable. Um, there will be a lot of retail places that close. Um, we're already planning that these can go over to uh, residential. So more people are probably going to be living on the high street than live at the moment. Uh, that means streets have got to change. Mm. Um, and and Milan, for example, is already pedestrianising 35 kilometres of road in the city centre because of the, the COVID. And they said, no, nah, we over-designed the cars. But so long, no, we've got to stop it. Barcelona's doing the same. All sorts of cities are saying, no, people on two feet are what make cities work, um, not people in something with four wheels. Mm. You've still got to get vehicles in um, and, and all of this. Yes, you can't just but they are not the top of the list. People on two feet are the top of the list. And kiddies being able to, to play safely. Um, you, know, you think of most towns and cities, where's, where's the nearest kids play area? You think, oh, I don't know, Is it, I don't know we've got. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's about two miles out of town. So things are, I think, potentially radically changing uh, for the better. For the best. Yeah. I think you I think tonight has really shown that this has been a, a, a really a kind of a, a bit of a boost. <laughs> Just thinking about all these initiatives and the way we're going and 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 the possibility. There's so much more knowledge there, and you've pointed out to us the research and 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 a lot of empirical study has been done, and we now know that this can work. So um, this could lead post-COVID to, to a really bright future.
future for trees and two-legged beasties. So um, I'm going to stop now because we have our open social time and we've gone on a long time, but only because your talk was fascinating and generated that so much long, interest <laughs> um no 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 it, it, it's just obviously something that that needs talking about so i want to thank you on behalf of the cohort and on behalf of my fellow conveners and myself it's mm -hmm. been a great pleasure thank you very much alan and thank you for giving us your time um very welcome fascinating